Hi everyone, and welcome to this mini lecture on what is theory. So we hear this word theory a lot in our education. We hear it in a lot of different ways. Um, we also hear it in the media a lot, and of course in the media we will hear it in ways that are often uh, questionable or misrepresented, such as conspiracy theory or something like the climate change is just a theory or evolution is just a theory. And in this mini lecture, we're gonna look at theory as it relates to the liberal, liberal arts, uh, and in particular the humanities, because in these environments, theory is a little bit different. But first, let's take a look at a textbook definition of theory. It is a supposition or a system of ideas intended to explain something, especially one based on general principles independent of the thing to be explained. So in this regard, we're looking at it's this, it's this way of approaching something um, on, an, on a subject that should essentially be held together regardless of um, or not necessarily need the thing itself to be explained. So we're going to kind of break this down a little bit and talk a little bit more about this as it applies to uh, other things besides science, because that's where we hear about most theories. And when we talk about theory outside of science, um, it aspires to be what we see as theory in science, uh, but it often has to fall short. So in this case, we'll take a look at what is theory, and in particular, how we might think about theory in popular culture. So theory ultimately becomes a frame to help examine, right? It is this idea of it's, it's a lens in which you can construct information or construct understanding about something you're looking at. Uh, it comes with certain assumptions, right? Within this frame is a certain way of seeing things, is a certain expectation about how things are. And by using this and applying those assumptions and this frame to the subject, it can often provide a deeper knowledge, a deeper understanding, or just a deeper, a, a different way of looking at the content. So we use theory to provide that deeper understanding of something that we just may not be that familiar with or we're trying to organize into some coherent way, method. So why do we need theories in popular culture? Well, the short answer is we don't. Uh, we really don't need theories per se. We could probably study popular culture without theories. Um, so I would say we don't need them, but we do like them. We do use them. They give us a much deeper way of, uh, of connecting larger themes within popular culture. And that's one of the big things that it does is it helps us organize our understanding of popular culture, how popular culture connects either across different areas of popular culture or within one area of popular culture. So it helps us to organize our thoughts, organize the ways in which we see connections. It also helps us to process. Uh, in this regard, you know, there's so many different things that we can look at within one item of popular culture. If we have a lens, if we have a theory to work with, this gives us a much stronger way of making our way through it. Uh, you can kind of think of it like if you have a needle in the proverbial haystack, how do, what do you do with that? How do you get to that needle? Well, you could start with a magnet, and that magnet could help you organize what is a needle and what isn't a needle. Um, it could help attract you to what it is that you are interested in or, or want to make sense of. And I think most importantly, theories help us dive deeper into popular culture. It shows us the ways in which there can be bigger knowledge than what's at the surface. And again, so much of what we talk about here in popular culture is about getting below the surface. Not just talking about the popular culture, but actually why we see what it is that we see. So when we deal with theory, uh, particularly in popular culture, or actually I shouldn't say particularly, it's throughout uh, the liberal studies, theory is really useful, but there are definitely people and there are that take issue with theory or that have concerns about theory. The first is that these theories are hard to test. You know, when we talk about theory in the scientific sense, it should often be 
quite clear and consistent how you can test it. But when we deal with theory within, say, popular culture, it's harder to test this. It's a lot of, you know, argumentation, but not necessarily things that you can prove. So that becomes a little bit harder to do. This is still useful, but it's, we can't necessarily say this is exactly what is happening. It comes with a legacy of criticism. And so what this means is there's so many different theories, and one theory is born out of another theory is born out of another theory, and each new theory is often born from the criticism of the previous. And so in order to understand one theory, you often have to learn another theory because that's where this theory came from. And for many people, that's overwhelming. It's kind of, you know, you can't just take on one thing, you have to take on all of those things, right? It's You're not just getting in a fight with one person, but with all of the brothers of that person because each one has given forth to some other theory. It can be limited in scope and experience, um, or it can, uh, rather, it, should, it can limit scope and experience. Uh, given that it is a frame and it helps you to focus, that also means it may leave you blind to other things. So if you are only focused through one particular theory, you might not be able to see other valuable things about the object that you are studying. And it can overload one's experience. And what I mean by this is that if you are so focused on a particular theory, it's going to mean that every time, everywhere you look, that's what you're going to be looking for. And I do see this happen with people where because they are so invested in a particular theory that it limits their ability to see beyond it in any given situation. So let's look at an example of theory in practice. And we'll actually look at two examples, um, both around The Hobbit, so that we can understand why or how this might work as a tool. So I'm predominantly talking about the films since currently they are probably quite popular. People have seen them or been aware of them, um, and there's a lot of things that you can draw upon there. But if we looked at The Hobbit and we were to use Marxist theory, now Marxist theory is a theory that analyzes the concepts of class and economy and thinks about what that communicates about characters, about the culture. So if we're using Marxist theory, it's one that's focused on class and economy. And so one question a Marxist is likely to ask is why are the orcs the only people disheveled and powerless and appear to be largely a slave class to the evil forces in the story? So what this question is asking is, well, if we look at the structure of the story, everybody seems to have some element of freedom and economic movement, but then you have these orcs, and though they may appear to take pleasure, they really don't have any, they don't appear to have any agency. They, they appear to be slaves. And so that would be a question raised by the by Marxist theory is, you know, this whole system, the hobbits and all they do, the dwarves and all they do, you know, yes, it's it's nice, but it comes at the cost of this evil class. And, you know, people might then back up and say, well, wait a minute, though, the, the orcs are evil. And there's a question of, are they? There's a question of, are they actually evil or is it that they are slaves to kind of that, the orc leader and the powers of Sauron? So that's one way in which a Marxist would maybe look at or think about The Hobbit. There's many different ways in which the, a, a Marxist theorist could analyze The Hobbit because there's a lot of ways in which people exchange things. Um, and so the Marxist would be very curious about what that exchange means and how that exchange communicates meaning, relationship, and culture. So another example that we can look at is feminist theory. And feminist theory often analyzes and discusses the representations of males and females, particularly with regards to power in place. And so the idea within feminist theory is to better understand, you know, the historical cultural roots that have led to what we have seen um, preeminently, although less so nowadays, is a male-centered cultural structure in which men are given power and opportunity um, and women are denied power and opportunity. So from the feminist theory, the, 
it would look at different stories or it would look at different artifacts of popular culture and ask, you know, how has this challenged that status quo or how does this weaken that status quo of uh, what we might refer to as a patriarchy, that is a male-centered society. Uh, so if we were to look at The Hobbit, of course, the, the f feminist theory might ask, a feminist might ask, why are female characters almost entirely absent? And what does that tell us about Tolkien's view of the women in power in both Middle Earth and potentially the real world? So that's an interesting question. You know, there are very few women in The Lord of the Rings. Uh, I'm sorry, in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings in truth. Uh, and it's interesting to note that the, here's a big difference between the book and the movies is that the book almost has no women at all. Um, very extremely few women, whereas the actual three movies of The Hobbit do have some women and do have some of those women playing powerful roles. But again, the female population is 51% of the entire population and yet in this film they're almost non-existent you know for every there is maybe one female one strong female for every 20 strong males and so there's a you know with that are exhibited in this show I'm sorry in this movie so it's something to be thinking about is so what does that tell us about what people can and can't expect given their their sex or their gender in a given culture um, so that's that's another way it helps us it helps us to make sense of the Hobbit or look at a Hobbit in a more in-depth way about things that are being communicated that are even necessarily consciously aware of all right so theory in this course um, you know, we deal with it a lot, and so it's the, the things I want you to be kind of aware of to think about um, as we explore these different theories is I just want you to be exposed to some of the major theories of analyzing popular culture, and just to get a better understanding of what they are and how they help improve or enhance or make sense of uh, popular culture studies. Um, I would encourage you to use the theories. Now, when using the theories, you're going to sometimes be way off base, and that's okay. I'm plenty of times way off base when I am using theory, and I have feedback from other people to help improve that. Um, but you can only really get a sense of the theories if, if you try to use them, if you try to apply them, if you look at popular culture and try to make sense of, well, how would a Marxist theory make sense of this, or how would a feminist theory make sense of this? Um, and as I said, expect to be wrong and not entirely right. Uh, people who study these things work at them at length and oftentimes still need help from others or still won't get it entirely right, uh, which, you know, again, can make it a little challenging. But play with theory in this course. Get out there and just kind of fool around with it and see what new ideas it leads you to because it can give you some really interesting ideas about the things you are studying. All right, so that's it about theory. I hope this helps in some way, and thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.